aside from the, the fact that there was political disturbance and turmoil at the time, brought about not only material uh, deprivation, but brought as well, imperceptibly, many psychic, emotional, psychological damage to the country, especially to the Filipino youth, who had nothing positive to look forward to. And it was the genius of uh, the late Chairman George T. to instill and to uplift the damaged morale uh, of the Filipino youth uh, through art. So he wanted to do something to mobilize the energies of our young people. So the predecessor of the Metrobank Art and Design Excellence was really conceptualized by him. He was the one who started it in 1984, the Young Painters Annual, the Made Painting Competition in 1984. The paintings generated by uh, MAID are able to uh, be a reflection of uh, the tensions, the conflicts, uh, the joys, the harmonies, the sorrows even, the despair, and the celebration of the Filipino psyche. In the 1980s, you see a lot of our entries going into social realism. The art scene uh, then was so different. Uh, there were only few people going to our uh, art exhibits. My process is uh, traditional. I do a lot of uh, studies uh, before I work on a big canvas. I won second prize in the oil category in uh, 1988. At that time, I was uh, very active politically. That piece is a um, commentary on leaders who are abusive uh, to its own people. It helps to be introduced in the galleries during the 90s as an award-winning artist. And uh, it gives you the opportunity to have a show in the mainstream galleries. Down to the 90s, for example, where even the issues of the 80s continued to be pursued, and there were certain aspects of, uh, shall we say, existentialism. In 1995, when I came in, I reviewed what has happened since 1984 and I said, maybe we can consult the young artists. So we, we put up the Young Painters Annual. The art scene was probably five times smaller than the art scene now. You put it from 8 to 12 in number of galleries. Then there's no internet, no cable, no cell phone. Nagsisimula siya sa idea, tapos gagawa ko ng drawings. Sa ngayon, gumagamit na rin ng, ng computers para dun sa mga metal frames. Kasi maraming bahagi yung trabaho. After that, susubukan siya sa loob kasi isa scalp pa siya. So maraming trial and error sa, sa gawang ito. Yung biyahe na yun, papuntang Antipolo, doon ko nakita yung image na yun na parang fish eye. Tapos naisip ko, ang gandang painting ko. Ito yung sasalik sa Metrobank. Na last trip, gabi na kasi noon. Ano. Pag Metrobank winner ka, parang kang Miss Universe. <laughs> May corona ka ng isang taon. Ano. Towards the uh, turn of the century, uh, you can see the manner by which the young Filipino artists are looking outside their own country and being influenced by other uh, developments, idioms being done in, in the art centers of the world. Then we also saw over the years the introduction of technology. And so uh, we decided to get involved in architecture and interior design. Uh, winning the MAID competition back then was very crucial and helpful in allowing me to be exposed to other platforms. You know, we just need to do all these different things to give, uh, you know, more depth into our social ecosystem, to contribute to, you know, different ways of responding to the world. I usually go out to where the people go, and that's where I find the most interesting things. I find pleasure in kind of transforming these familiar objects into something unfamiliar and have uh, the, the people who, who see them and uh, observe them uh, realize this, you know, from something strange and uh, upon close inspection, it's something very common, apparently. 
The piece that I made for the maid competition back in 2005 was called Cradle. It was a sawdust sculpture that was built over a, a wireframe. And uh, it's a technique that our mentor back in Philippine High School for the Arts, Mr. Roberto Fileo, as a way to uh, create cost-efficient sculptural work. Positive creative production is just a very human condition which uh, everyone needs to at least try maybe once in their lives. Nagsa start pala mag boom yung art. So tingin ko maswerte kami ng lahat kasi nando kami sa tamang oras, tamang panahon, nag boom yung career namin lahat pati yung mga friends ko. Lalo na ngayon kasi ngayon mas marami ng gallery, mas marami ng collectors, kumbaga mas marami ng lugar kung saan ka pwede mag-show. Nag-observe ako madalas kung ano nangyayari sa akin or sa paligid ko. Lalo na kapag nagkakram ako, hindi ako makatulog. Tapos parang, ah, bigla na pumapasok yung idea. Pero kapag kasobrang ang dami ko naisip, lahat siya sinusulat ko kasi hindi talaga ako lagi inspired. So at least kapag wala akong maisip, tumitingin lang ako doon sa mga sketches ko or doon sa drawing ko or kung ano nakasulat sa phone ko. Yung title niya patungo sa so watercolor on paper. So yung ginawa ko, uh, ulo siya ng aeroplano. Tapos katawan lang siya ng parang stick lang. Tapos nilagyan ko lang siya ng blue color kasi worker. Um, kasi ako yung nagtutok para sa Metrobank. Yung mga tao na nakikilala kong bago, yung mga bata, yung mga sudyante. Nakakatuwa kasi nakaka-inspire ka ng iba. Through the work that we do in the foundation, our program made, we were able to utilize art for advocacy work. Art is a very powerful tool. It is not simply a reflection of our national soul, but it has the ability to ignite social change and cultivate ideas. Art describes identity of a developing or developed nation. It expresses how an artist feels and think at that particular moment. And uh, art also describes who we are and where we're going. I had very equipped professors in art high school that made sure that we learned the value of art uh, as a tool for change, something that evolves depending on the issues and concerns of the community. I'm not comfortable that it's positioned only to the privileged few. A lot of people should engage with the work, pero sa lipunan natin, parang kulang pa siguro yung pagkalat sa kanya. We have always looked as made as a competition. Over time, there is a responsibility to the young artists as a whole. So we decided to programmatize our intervention for young people and we introduced the IDEA framework, inspiration, development of skills, exposure, and application. We wanted in the long term to develop our young people, so we have institutionalized incentives, program improvements every year. Something that we'd like to continue by bringing them to art spaces, not only the institutional ones like museums, but also in malls where people congregate. And that should be part of our advocacy, bringing art closer to the people. Young artists need to uh, focus on their art without uh, any distraction. So I suggest MADE. You know, to create an artist uh, residency program to provide uh, the artist studio space and uh, allowance for art materials and uh, living expenses. I'd like to think that art and artists are catalysts of society. I view our artists as producing new realities, new narratives, new ways of looking at things. And that is the history of MADE.
Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another installment of Art Made Public 2021. Every year, MADE visits different cities, museums, and schools all over the country to host public lectures on art and design. This year, we bring you the experience online. And today, we are joined by two trailblazing young leaders in the creative industries to talk about innovation, fostering a sense of community, and the dream for a better society fuels the development of art and design in the Philippines. Send in your comments and questions here, and you could be one of the three lucky winners of Crocis, a primer on Philippine architecture by Dr. Gerard Nico. Participants who are able to complete the lectures may also request for certificates after this event. Stay tuned, and we promise you all an exciting afternoon. in our first speaker, allow me to introduce our first speaker is Mr. Andre Nicolai Pamintuan. Andre is the festival director and founder of the Manila Fringe Festival Incorporated and the creative director of Philip Pineapple Lab, an artist-run space that features contemporary performances and interdisciplinary arts. He has divided his time between the Philippines and the U.S., where he took on various production roles in nonprofit theater, festivals, cultural organizations, and other arts-related fields. He completed a directing and producing program in the New York Foundation for the Arts Immigrant Artist Mentoring Program in Brooklyn, New York. Andre is one of the first Asian fellows of the Australian Council for the Arts Future Leader Program and is currently a mentor at the Salzburg Global Seminar Emerging Urban Leaders Program. He joins us today to talk about how French Manila and Pineapple Lab defied the impossible and continued to bring creatives together amidst a global pandemic. Let me give the virtual stage right now to Mr. Andre Pamintuan. Hi, Andre. Hello, good evening, or good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you so much uh, for, for, for the introduction, uh, Lelaine. And of course, before I start, I want to uh, give a shout out to the Metrobank Foundation uh, for continuing the good work and providing this platform so we can reach um, audiences uh, uh, across the Philippines and perhaps across the world uh, through this event. Um, so uh, we're gonna start. Uh, before I start, I just want to uh, make sure that, you know, uh, to, to, to let the, the audience know that I'll be speaking from, from my experience uh, and uh, hopefully uh, through my experience pre-pandemic and during the pandemic, uh, there will be insights that will be helpful uh, to our audiences today. So just to contextualize uh, who I am, where I'm from, what do I do? Um, I am originally from a uh, thriving city in Pangasinan called the Gupan City. Uh, that's me over there as a little kid walking around <laughs> on the street. Um, so uh, most of uh, my life was, at least my early life was spent in Pangasinan, and my 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 exposure actually to the arts started very young because my mother was a, a professor at the University of Pangasinan, and so what she would do um, was uh, she taught geography, um, and she would take us uh, during her field trips that she organized for her students, uh, you know, go to Banawi Raisterises, go to Calamba Laguna, to see Rizal's house, go to uh, Manila. And, and that really made an impact in, in my um, exposure and, and my interest in the arts. So, you know, going to the National Museum, seeing the Spolarium, um, you know, walking around Manila Bay, going up the escalators at, uh, I mean, CDO, COD, whatever, mga mall sa, sa Manila, no? Uh, and, and then, of course, watching theater. Um, so my, my background really uh, started uh, in theater. Uh, I studied in um, Ateneo de Malaya University with a, with a degree in uh, theater arts. Um, so 
uh, who am I? What do I do? I, I mean, there are titles there, no? But sometimes it doesn't really mean anything or it's confusing. So I'm a creative director. What that means, um, you know, I do, I'm an, also an independent producer, an arts manager, a director, a curator. So, uh, you know, the, you know, it's, it's hard to kind of categorize uh, what I necessarily do. So these are words that might be able to, to, to clarify a few things um, to uh, our, our, our audience and the students that are uh, watching. Um, so after I um, in in after the sixth grade, I moved to the states, and then for college, I went back to Ateneo, as I said, and then after college, I went back to the United States, and then I started working for uh, different nonprofit uh, theater organizations. Um, one of which was the the Fringe Festival in 2012, and so I I po- actually posted this photo recently in my stories, um, working for the Fringe NYC in 2012. 12 um, and that was the first venue that I organized and then uh, that, that I managed and that really inspired me uh, to kind of explore the idea of bringing the fringe festival concept to the Philippines uh, because I felt that uh, an independent festival uh art festival could fill in the gaps of what may not necessarily be uh, shown or or represented um, in, uh, in in the Philippine art scene at that time. Uh, so I'm just gonna show you a quick little video of Fringe Manila just to give you an idea of what the festival uh, was all about. And this video was from the 2020 festival. Uh, so please uh, go ahead and take it away. <laughs> Inspired by my experience as a venue director for the New York International Fringe Festival in 2012, um, I headed home to the Philippines uh, to establish the Manila Fringe Festival. Um, and the festival, con- the festival's concept, uh, whose roots uh, can be traced back to Edinburgh in Scotland, um, I think the first festival started in 1947, um, was launched in the Philippines in 2015 um, as an open act. Uh, non-curated multi-arts festival uh, that that I felt uh, could highlight the unique point of view of uh, local artists, especially artists who are emerging um, and established artists who may want to try something else or try try something new uh, with different genres and collaborations. Uh, 
as a as a festival director, um, my goal was to encourage a cross pollination of ideas and practices uh, that provide opportunities to engage with audiences uh, through diverse art activities and genres uh, in the region. So I so I formed a a team of volunteer staff and interns to help produce the festival, and my work with French Manila then uh, led to the establishment or the founding of um, a creative hub or an art space or a gathering space called uh, Pineapple Lab. And to just give you a, a picture of what Pineapple Lab uh, was um, as a space, uh, I'm, I'm going to show you another video. Hi, as you can see, we're located here on Palma Street, right here in Poblacion. Uh, so basically, Poblacion is uh, Makati's heart, basically. It, it's the first settlement that was ever established here in the city of Makati, 348 years old. Pineapple Lab is a artist-run creative hub. Our focus is on kind of showcasing the works of local artists, international artists, and really being a home for those collaborations. We have a calendar of events, we open at 11, we close at 6. That's our like advertised hours of operations, but there's usually events at night. Anything from film screenings, music jams, workshops. I think one of the most common challenges as an artist, whether it's performing or visual, is a platform. Whether it's a platform to create, a platform to make mistakes, a platform to collaborate or connect with other mentors, peers, community. Hi, my name is Leslie Espinosa and I'm an artist in residence here at Pineapple Lab. They support me here in Holoblock as a hairstylist, and they are a platform for me as a burlesque performer and performance artist. Burlesque PH is the premier troupe of burlesque in the Philippines, and we are all about performance, community building, uh, self-expression. We don't have limitations on who can join because everyone comes from different backgrounds. A huge importance of why we have this burlesque troupe is to have a platform ourselves for self-expression. From these like imposed notions of, of what Filipino art should be, how women are supposed to express themselves. With Pineapple Lab, we provide that space for them to kind of just do whatever they want, really, from visual arts to performance art. I think our main focus is the, is to kind of shine a light on the artists in the fringes, you know, the ones that aren't necessarily getting that much exposure, that much opportunity. So it's really our mandate to be a safe space for that. Pineapple Lab has been literally a partner. They don't limit the art that can be done, and we don't want to limit the art that can be done. In both ways, we want to push the envelope. We want to take risks. We want to grow art. We want to grow culture. We want to open minds about what is out there. And of course, that video was produced by the Creative Innovators Program by the British Council. And one of our executive uh, directors, Jodina Nagilion, was part of that program uh, for the British Council. Um, as I mentioned, uh, you know, my work with uh, Fringe uh, led to the establishment of Pineapple Lab, wherein Fringe was just a... Um, a once a year, a month long festival. Pineapple Lab was then uh, able to provide a year round space for these uh, fringe artists that we uh, we worked with during the festival. So, uh, you know, they were able to uh, have a, a safe space to create their work, uh, to to re uh, to 
develop audiences uh, and also to to make mistakes and uh, and really push the boundaries when it comes to um, art making and of course in in um, in reaching out to the local community so uh, with pineapple lab we wanted uh, to present innovative ways to showcase contemporary work as I mentioned those that are not necessarily represented in the mainstream um, art scene no um, And of course, we wanted to emphasize the value that art brings to culture and identity, and of course, uh, the 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 greater community that we were working with, which was, uh, as you saw in the video, uh, Poblacion Makati. Uh, and the work in the work that we did, obviously, we couldn't do it by ourselves, so we wanted to collaborate with uh, different cultural organizations to make arts more accessible to everyone. And when we're talking about access, uh, which I think you saw earlier um, in the the made video. Um, not everyone has access to arts. Not everyone has, let's say, the capability to 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 pay for a workshop or to go see a show. Um, and so, with our work with different cultural organizations, who, uh, you know, who provide us, for example, financial or monetary support or. Uh, or some sort of sponsorship with you know getting equipment, we were then able to uh, to keep the the ticket costs um, at a very low price point, or even provide uh, uh, the events that we do for free. Um, so Pineapple Lab, um, really, we wanted to make sure that we are a platform for emerging artists, artists who are women, and artists who are part of the LGBTQIA community. Um, why? Because I myself was an emerging artist, and I'm part of the LGBTQIA community, and I work with a lot of artists who are women, and 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 some. Sometimes, um, you know, when you don't provide a platform, these voices are not heard. These voices are not uh, included. They're not, uh, you know, part of, um, you know, they're not given the seat at the table. And so because we were an emerging art space, we wanted to work with those who um, who were going through the same thing um, as us, as, as an independent art space. And of course, we wanted to develop new audiences um, and engage with um, our local community in Poblacion, as I mentioned, and to really look at art as a tool to strengthen neighborhoods and cities. Um, so some of the cultural programming that we did, obviously, were film screenings, um, exhibitions, movie screenings. Uh, we activated different spaces as well, not only in um, not only in Poblacion, but also um, historic landmarks, for example. Um, or we would go outside of Poblacion, have pop-up performances in Cubao, in Escolta, in Intramuros, in, in Manila. Um, Um, so so really um it was a, it was a way for us to to make sure that audiences are exposed to 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 contemporary works that are being done now that are in response to the to the social um and cultural realities that many artists are going through Um, so many, a lot of the things that we did obviously um, you know dependent d- depended depended on gatherings and um, communities coming together uh, which was um, an amazing way for artists to start networking um, and perhaps uh, start conversations on possible collaborations when they go to um, a pineapple lab or a fringe event uh, because oftentimes um, or at least, you know in the in the early in the earlier years when i was like an artist um in the philippines you know theater people were theater people uh you know visual artists just you know were just visual artists there was not necessarily a lot of opportunities uh to um to establish some sort of connection or uh gathering spaces and that's what we wanted uh, pineapple lab to be 
Um, some of the collaborations that we do um, is with, again, with local organizations and with uh, different government agencies and the local government. Because we were established in, uh, we were based in Makati, we wanted to make sure that, you know, we work with uh, Poblacion and the city of Makati. So some of the things that we organized with them was a touring exhibit, for example, um, and a children's show uh, to, to celebrate the city of Makati. Um, we worked with the design uh, with design center of the Philippines to organize Design Week Philippines to help organize Design Week Philippines in 2019, and then in 2020 we organized we helped organize the the the, the, the digital festival, um, and then we're also doing that again for 2021. But obviously, uh, everyone got hit uh, by uh, the pandemic and. Uh, Pineapple Lab uh, had to close our space. And apparently, people wrote articles about it. So, uh, I, I, I kind of like did like a whole sort of like goodbye to the space and ode to the space and ode to the artists that we work with. Um, and some um, news agencies, I guess, or... Uh, uh, websites picked it up and then wrote articles about it so uh so so then we had to deal with what was happening in the pandemic um you know so so i'm going to talk about uh some of the challenges and the opportunities you know that we've experienced so obviously not being able to gather was some um, was was a big thing because our gatherings um, you know, our events were were our way was a way for the organization to to uh, no, to to be able to sustain ourselves, right? And to also for for the communities to come together as artists. You know, we want that like live energy um, that we get from our audiences. Um, as an organization, Pineapple Lab and Fringe lost projects that would have sustained the space. Um, and one of the reasons why we had to let go of the space is that we, you know, gatherings were not allowed and we couldn't earn. We couldn't earn anymore and it didn't make sense to keep the space. Um, so we've had to cancel um, collaborations with local artists and international artists and some, um, and some projects with the city of Makati, for example. And I think at large for artists um, in the Philippines, um, this affected how we were able to sustain ourselves as individuals because most artists are full a lot of artists are full-time artists you know they're 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 gig workers they're raqueteros and raqueteras right um and and because of this sort of like reality um we uh, collaborated uh, on creating I lost my gig that which in the early onset of the pandemic uh, uh, gathered information and data uh, to, uh, to to see um, how many artists um, and uh, freelance workers were affected uh, by by the pandemic and then you know, I was talking to Laleen earlier from from the Metro Bank Foundation. The data that that we gathered here was then, you know, uh, they, they read up on it and and help at least uh, inspire them to continue uh, continue the work of of made and and uh, likewise with um, with uh, I believe the. Congressman of the Venetia included the data um, from I lost my gig.ph to kind of push for the the freelancers bill that's create uh, that's currently um, going on um, in uh, in Congress. Um, so so those those are some of the one of the biggest things that we actually did uh, during the pandemic was was to to help spearhead I lost my gig.ph and of course um, you know. Personally, uh, and daming depression, anxiety, we, we, we've had to kind of deal with all of that uh, dur during this time. And, and, and I think one of, the, uh, one of the bigger things was to kind of like step back a little bit from, from, from wanting to do community work uh, and also take care of ourselves, right? Uh, think of new ways to, 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 to innovate. And, and some of the opportunities was also 
to embrace the virtual space as the physical space. And one of the events that we did, as I mentioned earlier, was to work with um, the Design Center of the Philippines to curate and help organize uh, design, um, design, design Week uh, in October 2020, which really focused on hyper-collaboration for a better normal. Um, so innovations to champion advocacy. So, so we still wanted to do. Obviously, we we and as community workers, as cultural workers, we we really still wanted to do the work that we did after stepping back. So um, we continued uh, organizing uh, virtual events. Uh, for example, you can see a virtual interact. Um, work a series of workshops that happened last year, and and I'm currently actually working on that right now. Um, so that that we we got three artists from Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao to do free online workshops to students. Uh, we collaborated with WWF um, for an Earth exhibit. We worked with different organizations based in London. Um, and again, these are just uh, some uh, some examples of 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 really how we wanted to continue our advocacies, which is really still working with artists and making arts accessible to everyone. Uh, okay. So learning points, no learning points. So dream like it's 2012. Kaya medyo relevant yung IG post na yung selfie ko naka red glasses, no? Uh, because my caption was dream uh, to dream like it's 2012. And 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 that's one of the things that I, I I realized in the last few days preparing for this presentation. Na parang um uh, in 2012 I wanted to start Fringe. I wanted to I wanted to 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 do something big. That was impossible right and throughout the years medyo nawawala yan eh. once you achieve your dreams parang okay ka na you just kind of go through the motions but because of the pandemic um i've had time to reflect in terms of channeling that sort of that curiosity that inner child that 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 andre from from his 20s you know so so i think for me openness um openness and remaining curious was one of the 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 learning points that personally i feel was important and was um helpful for me to kind of push through the things that i do um to to explore new ways and possibilities of collaborations and for me i was really hesitant with the digital space so i really wanted to embrace this and that's what we're, we're doing now right um um to reach out still to artists um, even if you don't necessarily want uh, you know have work uh, with them or, or um, to offer them but to just kind of like say hi hello it's always nice to to to, to have a sense of community um, and of course I think this is really important for everyone to to take care of yourself because you you can only give so much, but if you don't take care of yourself, you don't take care of your mental health, you don't take a walk, you don't take your vitamins, you don't, you know, you don't, uh, you, you don't relax your mind, um, you know, wala tayong maibibigay. So, you know, in order to, to drive the car, you must fuel the engine and it's really important to fuel your engines. Um, so what's next for Pineapple Lab? Uh, we because we wanted to embrace the the festival. Uh, I mean the festival, the 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 the, the changes um, that are happening and the realities that are happening. We started a podcast called Leave Your Shoes Outside, which interviews different artists and creatives to kind of check in on what they've been going through during the pandemic, uh, to talk about their current work and to talk about um, you know some of the the again the innovations and the learnings that that they've that they've been doing in order uh, for them to continue the work. Um, our resident vintage shop called Glorious Diaz went online uh, and started selling their clothes online because we lost the physical space. Um, right now, we are working with 98B Collaboratory and um, the Hub Make Lab, which, which are two organizations that are based in Escolta. So there's three labs working together. Um, so it's like a lab triumvirate. Um, so, so we've kind of uh, been... Uh, um, helping with programming in the space as well. 
Um, I, personally, I'm currently working on Paalalabas, which is a, a COVID-19 campaign uh, with the Design Center of the Philippines to remind people na mag-mask, mag-distancing, at magtulungan. Because, we, you know, in order to thrive in, 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 this, in this pandemic, we have, to, um, uh, we have to be vigilant in terms of uh, uh, how we conduct our everyday lives. And I'm, and I'm also working on my website, Andre nikolai.com uh, uh, to kind of, you know, uh, put myself out there, ikanga. And then um, I'm also currently working on the uh, on a new um, artist in residency program called the Anak Banua Arts uh, Residency Project um, in collaboration with the 4th District of Pangasinan. Uh, okay. And so, what else? Personally, I, I'm right right now. I'm I'm here in the states. I've been here for a year. I didn't think I was gonna be here for a year. Um, I'm gonna play a video to kind of show you what I what, what what's happening right now for me. Part of my learnings was try something that you've never done before also. So I've always wanted to be a barista. I've always wanted to, kn to know how to make coffee. Um, and so while I was here in the States, I was like, you know what? There's a coffee shop, which I will not name. Um, <laughs> like literally walking distance from where I live right now. I was like... Ang saya siguro, no? While I'm here, I can like, you know, upskill and, and, and make coffee. And, and of course, earn some extra money. Because while I do um, my work with Pineapple Lab and Fringe, uh, in the evenings, um, my days are pretty much, you know, pretty much open. So I was like, you know what? Might as well work um, for, uh, uh, might as well work on something that I've always wanted to do. And that, what, that was becoming a barista. So well, currently, I'm a, I'm a barista. Um, and uh, the the next thing for me, uh, I got accepted to the University of uh, or to to U uh, at UAL uh, Central Saint Martins uh, for a master's in uh, applied imagination in the creative industries. Again, still related to what I do, um, and uh, to to kind of explore uh, the possibilities of um, you know of what. Of, of, of how we can develop the, the, the creative industries in the Philippines and, and of course what what are the what is the role of artists and creatives in the creatives industry um, so yeah so with that said uh, those are the things that I, that I wanted to share with everyone um, if you do have questions please uh, ask me later uh, Otherwise, uh, I just want to leave you with this question. What is the value of art for you? Uh, and, you know, um, and art exists everywhere. Um, and, and art exists uh, to kind of make us feel more human again. So that I want everyone to kind of reflect on that. Uh, with that said, please, um, if you uh, follow me on uh, Twitter, on Instagram as well. And uh, thank you so much for, uh, for providing me the space to share you my insights made. Thank you so much for that, Andre. So dream like it's 2012 and try something that you've never done before. So let us proceed to our next speaker. Allow me to introduce her. Our next speaker is from the Anthology Festival director and curator, Miss Rebecca Plaza. Rika graduated from the University of Bath, where she was awarded the Sir Basil Spence Design Prize for Exceptional Multidisciplinary Design. 
She was also awarded the gold medal in 2016 for Asia's Young Designer Awards and named one of Lifestyle Asia's 30 Under 30 Game Changers of the Philippines. She is also a global shaper of the World Economic Forum. She is currently a student of Master in Philosophy in Architecture and Urban Design Program of the University of Cambridge and works as the Managing Director of Plaza and Plaza Partners. Rika joins us today to share how one of the country's biggest architecture festivals went online to bring together creatives from all over the world. Let me turn over our virtual stage to Ms. Rebecca Plaza. Hi, Rika! Hello, hi Louise. Um, thank you so much for having me today. It truly is an honor to be here um, on behalf of the organization to be able to share with you the work that we've been doing over the last uh, six and a half, almost seven years. Um, so thank you again for allowing me to share my story to everybody. Um, some of you might know us, but if you don't, um, Anthology is a three-day architecture and design festival that showcases architecture and design within the Philippines um, with an emphasis, yeah, so within the Philippines and also the Southeast Asian region. The festival serves as a platform to bring together people from all over the world um, and from all over the world and different industries in the built environment to um, increase awareness and um, to increase awareness about architecture and design and to elevate really and emphasize the relevance of it in our daily life. Um, I can go on and describe it, but I think um, it would not be the same as actually visually seeing it. Um, so I have prepared a video for you and if you could just share that please for everybody to see. The last three days have been extremely exciting and the energy levels are just through the roof. We've heard some of the industry's brightest stars from all over the world share their ideas that will really push boundaries for architecture relevant to the Philippines in today's time. Anthology started four years ago as a platform for people to come together and share their ideas about architecture. It's grown so significantly and exponentially in the last couple of years. Where we first had 2,000 people in 2016, the festival has now grown to over 5,000 people who have been here this weekend to celebrate with us. We've had extremely insightful discourse over the last couple of days and there are so many new brewing ideas that have come about as a result of discussion and from the shelter dialogues and from the, from the talks. And so we're hoping to digest and collate all these ideas and put them together so that we're able to come together with a sort of manifesto whereby we can use the ideas to solutions that are applicable not only to the Philippines but also relevant to today's time. People who come to the event take away from it is that technology can be used as a tool to help further your design work and your architectural work in the field. So you can think of technology as another tool you have in your toolkit to help you create better customer experiences, to help you with your design intention, and to help communicate that either through virtual reality or augmented reality, or even through 3D modeling and 3D mapping of your spaces. The awareness for people to explore what it might be just gives me so much hope. There are people filling this conference, asking questions, searching, struggling, arguing to find a Philippine voice as expressed architecturally. We've had insightful discourse. We hope you'll all be inspired to explore new and impactful ideas to improve the level of architecture and design in the Philippines. Thank you everybody for coming. We hope you had an absolutely fantastic weekend and we hope to see you again next year.
video is a bit outdated. This was taken in 2019. Um, it was only our fourth festival at, but back then, but now we've already had six. Um, and the event has really grown exponentially um, over the years. So it's something that we are truly, truly proud of. Um, yeah. So um, Anthology really started in 2016. Um, it was founded by my partner, William T of WTA Architecture and Design. Um, and back then it started really with 2000 people um, on a two day weekend. Um, on the following year, it, we, we gathered, it became a three day event and we were able to gather 3000 people. And it has grown ever since um, in our last physical event in 2020, we had 6,000 attendees over the three days. But this year, when we had it digitally and online, we were able to gather 8,532 unique viewers over a weekend with, um, with people from over 23 countries around the world. So that is something that we are truly, truly proud of. Um, as I mentioned, um, this event was really founded by um, William T, who is, um, he's, he's our chairman. He's the chairman of, of, of the event. Um, and in the, in, the, in the span of the six years that Anthology has been um, around, um, there have been multiple directors, including myself and Arvind Pangilingan. Um, I um, joined the event officially in 2018, um, where, yeah, I joined the event officially in 2018. Um, just to give you a bit of background about, about myself, I am the managing director and founder of Plaza and Partners. It is an architecture um, and architecture, urban design, and interior design firm where we, where, where we're about, we're about 20 in the team and we, we work on projects all over the country. Um, this is something that I do on the side. Um, and this is something that we do truly out of passion. Um, because it's such a huge, huge event with so much logistics, it really, truly takes a village um, to bring this all together. There are so many wonderful and passionate and amazing people behind the scenes. Um, it's not only the three people that you see here, but we have wonderful people like Alexa, we have Kathy Saldana, both from internally, in, from, our, from our companies, but also people who just volunteer. Um, Anthology is a nonprofit organization. We literally make no money out of this. Um, in the first three years, it was always Luge, but eventually we were able to um, turn it into something that is self-sustaining. Um, but the people behind this are truly what makes it happen. The people behind this truly believe in lifelong learning um, and have true, a true love for architecture because this is something that we, we do only in our free time. Um, so as I mentioned, this really was established in 2016 and William had built the Bookstop project, which, which I think it's still in Plaza Roma, which stands outside, um, which stands outside the Manila Cathedral in Intramuros. And he was hosting multiple events for the bookshop. And you know, he had singers, he had um, he had artists, he had all sorts of people come and 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 have events around this. And he looked around and he said, if architecture is the mother of all arts, why are we not doing anything to celebrate architecture? So within two weeks, he decided, you know what? I want to have a party. Um, I'm going to bring people together and we're just going to talk about architecture. So if you see on the images on, on the left, um, you'll see how very informal and how casual, how casual and laid back it was. Um, so this went on for two days and it was a great success and everybody loved it. Um, and so William decided to continue it to the following year. Um, in the following year, it moved to Plaza, uh, to Puerto del Parian, in also in Intramuros. Um, and from basically what you saw in the earlier slides, whereas we had something like this, uh, 2017 grew into something with two stages. Um, on one side, we had lectures, and on the other side, we had panel discussions. And all around the festival, we had other competitions. Um, William had also launched his book. Um, so that was context and intent. That also went on for three days. The first event was completely and absolutely free. The second event, um, there was an entrance fee of 500 pesos, but that was really just to cover uh, the free merchandise that we gave away. Oh no, I'm missing a slide. Okay, there. Um, um, so in 2018, 
it then moved to uh, um, Fort Santiago. Um, and I think this is really where the true essence of anthology was finally and truly established. We were so honored to have made as a partner for this event. Um, but now we had, um, we, we, we incorporated workshops. We had a proper opening. Um, we had um, speakers from, you know, it was in the previous years, it was a bit more challenging to invite speakers because who knew, we, we wanted the best minds in the industry and who knew, like, if you were from, I don't know, another country, why would you come to the Philippines for a small, for a small event? Well, relatively small. But in 2018, we really started to gain traction. And um, in this image, we have like professors from the Harvard Graduate School of Design. We have people from Arcadis. Um, we had Chris Brecht. Um, um, if you guys follow him on Instagram, he's Tenda. Uh, we also had, um, you know, the top, the, the top leaders in architecture and design in the country. So anthology really grew its roots in Intramuros. We started again, as I mentioned, at the Plaza Roma, and then it moved over to Puerto del Parian. And then we moved over to Fort Santiago. And I believe now it is the largest event that takes place in Intramuros every year. Um, so as I mentioned in 2018, um, it got so much bigger. From two stages, we then moved into three stages with simultaneous events taking place like workshops, competitions, um, debates, um, and lectures. And we also had, I think it was something of about 40 guests from all over the world, we flew them in. Um, we had the architects like Kai Uwe Bergman of the Art Engels Group who made the building up in New York as I've shown, um, and Chris Brent, Chris Brecht, who came all the way from Austria. So it was really just a wonderful experience to have everybody with us. Um, and to quote Kai Uwe Bergman, he mentioned that Anthology is one of the most ambitious and rewarding conferences of its kind. It celebrates the best of Philippine design and brings to the world, and it brings, it brings, the, it brings to the world, and it brings the world to the Philippines. I thoroughly enjoyed speaking at Anthology last year and meeting all my creative Philippine colleagues in such an inspiring setting. Um, and I think that's one of the most um, one of the one, most wonderful things about Anthology. You bring the people to this wonderful, wonderful place. Intramuros is so beautiful. And actually, before Anthology, the last time I went to Intramuros was probably when I was in grade school, like 15 years before. So it was so nice to sort of re rediscover and be reintroduced to this this beautiful gem that we have in our city um, in 2018 because it had ballooned and I, as i mentioned this is bootstrap this is something that we totally do out of the goodness of our hearts um william was so so very tired um and three days before the event he was talking to me um and he said i'm so tired i don't want to do this anymore next year like it's great but i have my hands full and I love the event so much that I said, well, why, why would you do, why would you do that? Like you built it up and it, it's such a wonderful experience. And every year we tell people, we, we get people telling us how, um, how much they learn just being around some of the greatest minds in the industry. Um, why would you give it up? And like I said, it had ballooned so much. The event cost so much to deliver. Um, and without knowing how I would, you know, he runs one of the largest architecture firms in the industry. And I was, I had, I had barely three years to my name. So I said, you know what? Um, if you don't want to do it, I'm going to do it. Um, I didn't know how I was going to do it, but I just knew that I wanted to do it. So I said, okay, I'll take over as festival director. I'll help you. I don't know how I'm going to do it, but I will. So the following um, in 2018, I then took over as director and um, my preparation was a year long preparation. I, um, I had to, the event cost somewhere of about like eight, nine, 10 million. I didn't know where I was going to get that money. I literally started with 50,000 pesos. That's all I had. That, that's all I could afford to put out. Um, but what I did was I went around to every single supplier in the industry and I looked for sponsors and I said, look, this is such a wonderful event. And I personally spoke to them and begged for money and begged for support. Um, we were so lucky to have, um, um, to, have to have had captured the imaginations of so many other people in the industry. Um, 
that we raise enough event just barely to deliver and the remaining the remaining bit that we needed to cover our costs we were able to do so in selling tickets um again i did this when i was 27 i didn't have any money but what i did have was vol- a team of volunteers to truly help me and they were so passionate about it um so shout out to the volunteers from la salbanil because they were so amazing they went all over the country um um selling tickets with me promoting the event um for a year and this was really all truly out of the goodness of their hearts um so in 2019 um i took over and one of the things that i wanted to do um as the director was to make sure that architecture truly or this event would truly make an impact um william laid the foundations of really getting this event together but i also felt that it was architects just talking to architects um i was so amazed by the events that you know there was so much to learn and there was so much um there was so much information valuable information and valuable lessons to be learned but it was architects preaching to the choir so when i took over i said i want to be able to create impact i want people from other industries i want change makers to be able to um to be able to pick up all these lessons and apply them um oftentimes it's really a matter of connecting um to two organizations to make to make things happen so when i took over i wanted to make sure that this encompassed the architecture industry i wanted it to encompass any anybody or anyone who is related to the built environment um so this was the first and we really wore no political color so i don't care um where you're from who you're from what you believe in but as long as you truly believe in the power of architecture and design i want you to be in my event so that year um i had um we had senators we had ambassadors we had um developers we had people from the department of transportation dpwh um and we had educators we had architects basically anybody as long as you love architecture you have anything to do with it i want you here also that year was the year of um build 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 like that was really the zeitgeist guys at the time and so i wanted to use architectural creativity um to to serve as a blueprint for what we could do with our future and so um that was the theme um and we had um you know it was another wonderful 3 days and i think while that was while while it was important to get other people from other industries to listen to us to listen to what we had to say i think at the end of the day it was also just so important that we architect like that the architects that you know the practitioners just truly enjoyed themselves and would sort of get a rekindled um love and appreciation for architecture and design so i think one of the most rewarding things that was said to me was um tonight i don't feel like an architect i feel like a rock star so i want to emphasize that art uh, that anthology is not a conference it is a festival so it's an outdoor event and um and there was a headline actually in one of the newspapers and it was like anthology is the coachella of architecture and design so um that's something that we are truly truly proud of um in the following year it was now so much easier to get um speakers from all over the world and i kind of like used all my friend credits like basically every friend i had i called them and i asked for a favor like hey can you introduce me to this person can you introduce me to this person but because we sort of legitimized legitimized the event in 2019 um it then became so much easier to grow the event and before we were begging people to come people were now people were just coming to the event um we have we have had wonderful speakers we've had wong won sum who um he uh designed they're the architects of the world building of the year um which was in 20 2020 yeah world building of the year in 2019 but it was in 2020 um so these are some of the 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 these are some of the buildings that have been built by the wonderful wonderful speakers that we have uh we not only um we get all these amazing minds from not only the not only abroad but even the philippines and i think with with the number of people who come to the event it's just a wonderful way to learn directly from from you know from your mentors from the people that you look up to it 
and and see. And all of these mentors, you'd be surprised, they're so willing to share and learn, um, to share and give uh, what whatever they can so that to improve and elevate the level of architecture and design in the industry. Um, Alongside, as I mentioned earlier, alongside the two stages, the lectures and the and the panel discussions, we have competitions that we we host in the run up to the event. We've had a pho photography competition. Um, we've given away internship programs as well um, as prizes. We have a school pavilion. We have live design. Uh, we have digital art. And I think one of the wonderful, um, one of the more amazing events that we have is the professional. Um, competitions where this started really in 2019 when I called my friend and I said, hey, do you want to build anything? Um, and he said, well, I have like a pavilion that I want to build. And I said, okay, I don't want to be your designer, but we can make it a competition. So let's open it up and whoever wins, they will be your architect for, for your pavilion. Um, so it's really truly about connecting many people. And so I think that year, um, the architects uh, who won also not only won prize money from the event, but also a contract to design the pavilion with that developer. Um, so it's also about like, you know, sharing opportunity that's available out there. Um, we also host these amazing workshops. Um, I'm so proud of this. Um, we usually pay so much money to travel abroad to, you know, get to partake in workshops and in short short courses and whatever but what we were doing with anthologies we were bringing that to anthology arab is one of the world's um world's leading engineering firms they were the engineers behind the sydney opera house behind um behind uh the beijing cctv basically any significant building that you can think of they were probably the engineers um they have been so supportive of this event and they hosted a three-day workshop on um, on transported oriented design from people they flew in from Hong Kong just for the event. We also had um, people from SKU Collaborative who were actually professors at Hong Kong U and at the National University of Singapore also give an event. We had people from SOM who, who are basically, who have built basically every major skyscraper in the world, including a Burj Khalifa, come here and share and give people um, give people workshops on this. And of course, PDP Architects uh, run by Kathy, Kathy Saldana, who um, they gave a workshop on this. She gave a workshop on the SDGs of the UN um, in relation to architecture. So it's really all of these things come for free with the event. Um, you just need to sign up to them. Um, and I think one of the more interesting things that we had um, in the 2020 edition was the follies and installations. Um, so this, um, what we had, what we did here is we, you know, architects, usually you design buildings and sometimes you just want to get creative and you want to be able to just, um, make these interesting structures without really having to think about a building. And so we had, um, people do installations, the one above on the left, um, that's from vision art. Um, the one below is from uh, Jonathan Gan, and the other one is from Paulo Alcazarin. So it's just wonderful um, to show and express in an art form how you um, would do this. Anyway, moving forward, one of the last, uh, we also had an anthology pavilion. This was designed by William T. Um, and this was, he wanted to explore with architecture without architects. So he created this without plans and he literally, what they did was in three days, they used the simplest of materials, which is a, um, which is wood and plastic and anything that they could gather to build this. And it actually served as a really nice and habitable space that was the VIP tent and where, where we had press cons during, during the festival. Um, this happened in February, 2020. So a month away from, a month away from um, COVID. And when COVID hit, Two weeks into lockdown, while all of us were watching K-drama, William was getting really bored and he called me up and he said, we need to do something. We can't just sit here and make acrylic boxes for people. Like We need to do something more. Um, their hospitals are running out of beds. People don't have any place to go to quarantine. Why don't we use the anthology pavilion to create quarantine facilities? And I said, okay, game. <laughs> so 
I said, what do you need me to do? And he said, I need you to find me materials. I need you to find me donors. Let's build two quarantine facilities. There are two army hospitals that need them. Let's build them. So William worked on the design and I then contacted all our sponsors from Anthology and I said, yo, I need materials. I need money. Like we need to buy this. There are two hospitals um, that need them. And the support was so overwhelming. Uh, we got so much money from so many people and I called him and I said, well, we have more materials than we need for two, um, for two pavilions. And he said, go find more hospitals. I'm sure that they need them. So I was basically the sitting, the person behind the scenes, and he was on the forefront. Um, and I think I want to show you a video to explain that. Weeks into the quarantine, hospitals in Metro Manila have declared that they are at capacity with COVID-19 related cases. With insufficient bed space, our hospitals will likely face the worst case scenario if we don't take action. To adjust the growing concern quickly and efficiently, WTA Architecture and Design Studio and industry experts designed an emergency quarantine facility that can be built in only five days to help hospitals augment their space. Medical organizations and local government units collaborated with the EQF team to build the facilities near or on their property to be able to functionally accommodate suspected cases. The idea behind all this was that we wanted to find what architecture can do in this crisis, what role architects have to play in our communities. And we want to show that we are here to build for our communities. Thinking about this problem, we figured that basically building quarantine facilities is the only way for us to keep the growth of this virus down. And so we're creating space for everyone, letting everyone know that there's a space for them. Um, we're building these to augment the hospitals and trying to increase the capacity of all our healthcare system. So what we thought about was that the most important thing that we need is speed and scalability. So we're using wood and plastic. Materials that are very forgiving, that are very familiar. These are materials that don't need to have special equipment or training, and that can be spread out across our archipelago nation. And for architecture to really matter, we have to build for everyone. Each EQF benefits at least 16 patients with sanitizing areas for medical responders. The structure's material design is flexible in order to accommodate modifications to reach small barangays. Dito po sa facility po na to, maayos po kami na kapag pahina. Isa pa po, uh, malamig po siya, kumbaga komportable po kami na naka, nakakuha ng aming tulog po or ng aming um, Yung pahinga po na kailangan namin is natutugunan po sa pamamagitan ng fasilidad po na ito. Today, we have built 62 emergency quarantine facilities. Your donations have come so far, but the work is not yet done. At this point of our build journey, we have come to realize that it takes each one of us to overcome the current crisis. Your participation matters. Your continued support will help flatten the curve Help us enable our medical frontliners to treat the sick and heal the wounded. Because in our darkest hours, as a nation, we build as one. So in the end, we were able to reach 75,000 emergency quarantine facilities and 1,200 beds, which we completely donated at zero cost to the hospitals that needed them. They were only supposed to last for three months. They were only a temporary fix, a temporary solution. But we've heard that many hospitals are still actually using them. They were actually so very adaptable in that I think, I can't remember which hospital it was. It was either, I don't remember, but um, one of them they didn't want an emergency quarantine facility. What they wanted was a surgical, uh, a room for surgery because they needed to move, move the surgeries outside from the hospital and keep the COVID patients inside the hospital. So that was truly, truly so overwhelmingly successful. And it all started from this idea. It all started from the Anthology Pavilion. And the same sponsors who sponsored Anthology were the same sponsors who went, who were with us throughout the event, uh, through, through, who were with us to support the building of the emergency quarantine facilities. I know I'm running out of time. Um, so we did host, um, so I'm just gonna go click We did host Anthology um, in 2020 online. Um, and this, from what you saw earlier, it then transformed into um, the next event. And this was this was really spearheaded by Arvin Pangilingan. But if you could share the video, please. 
Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Finally, Finally to you. glad to see you. Welcome to Anthology, Tiffany. Hi. Hi, Kathy. Hi, everyone. Good evening. Welcome back, Welcome back. to Anthology. What makes a city? Is it infrastructure? Is it the mix of both old and new, the heritage with the modern structures? At the end of the day, it's the people who power it and make decisions about living in it. And therefore, we welcome all of you to this exciting discussion. We only have one goal, basically. We, we just want to build a better tomorrow for everyone. We're blessed to be working with people who are actually understanding of that. We're here at our scale model exhibit. We have Dragnos Design Studio, Hasas Architects, Sangai Architects, Paad Studio, Kaki Saldana. Crisis, they transcend all boundaries. And I'm so glad to see that the next generation is trying to figure out a city that does not have boundaries, that does not divide us, but actually brings us together. Don't allow yourself to be defined by a moment, but allow yourself to be defined by this constant pursuit of change, of how to be better. Architecture is not going to solve problems, but it can be a tool to be able to achieve more, right? For a greater humanity and such. We have forgotten that our towns and cities have long histories and the embedded memories in them. We have to go back and get in touch with our roots and, and use that as a basis for our future designs. When I think about the future of architecture, it's actually becoming a bit secondary. And I think there's nothing wrong with architecture becoming a less important profession and allowing some of those others to be more dominant in terms of how we shape our cultural cities. Architecture cannot change society. But through the processes of our architecture, we can be part of change that's underway. Architecture, city, and landscape are well melted, well integrated to create the new experiences. The main reason on why we're doing this every single year is not just connect the speakers where we have every single year, but also give awareness to the students, the young professionals, the professionals, all of uh, the design professionals. Uh, we're, we're listening and always supporting Anthology Festival. You know, the reason we are having this festival this year um, is to push this idea that even, you know, when we're staying home, uh, we can always continue to learn. And we really look forward to seeing you next year once we're all free to go back to Intramuros. Okay, there. Okay, so to give you a life update, basically, um, where we're I know I'm running out of time. Um, to wrap up, basically, to give you a life update of where we're at. Um, remember when I said that early? Oh, I still have five minutes. Oh my gosh, I've been like speed racing through this. But anyway, um, um, so as you will have seen, that's how we sort of transitioned to an online sort of life. Um, to give you a life update, um, remember when I said earlier that when I took over. Uh, or when I joined the organization formally um, as a director, one of the things that I wanted to do was to create impact, was to create life lasting relationships between the people who meet at Anthology. Um, and I'm so happy because this year um, we've had many people reach out to me and say, thank you so much for hosting Anthology because, because of, and because of Anthology, it has because anthology laid the foundation for partnerships between many people that have been very successful. Um, in 2019, one of our keynote speakers was Ole Shiren, who came, um, who's an who is who's a practicing architect. He he did the Beijing CCTV Tower. He did um, he did um, interlace in Singapore and many other brilliant projects. And I'm so happy to share that they that a new building that because of that event where we also had. Um, 
Franco Soberano of Cebu Landmasters. The two were able to meet and they hit it off. And now they are building a 125 room resort um, in Mactan. And it will really add to the skyline of Cebu. So I'm super looking forward to that. And it will help elevate the level of architecture and design in the Philippines. So that's only one example of the many successful partnerships that we've had in Anthology. There are like, I can count eight others of which I am totally not involved, but like, you know, people meeting um, at Anthology. And so there have been even couples, like, like boyfriend, girlfriend. So it's not only about, buildings but also about um, basically lasting relationships and meaningful relationships between people if you've also seen the huge ass guy on EDSA um, that is by one of our resident um, speakers his name is Jeffrey Manuel he, he's amazing he's an artist um, and Jeffrey um, also with um, at, at the event we have the guys from SM so it's really strengthened their relationship and we have this wonderful nice new art piece on along EDSA so it's 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 so happy and so fulfilling to know that Anthology has been able, it really has been a catalyst for wonderful relationships and meaningful relationships to elevate architecture and design in the Philippines. Um, at the end of the day, um, it really is truly about us. It is about people and how we can use architecture to improve our quality of life and how we can bring, bring people together to share all these amazing ideas. Um, and that's really the spirit and essence of anthology. Um, I know I'm supposed to talk about future plans, but we don't know yet. What well, all we know is we really want to be able to um, host the event physically. Um, hopefully, I don't know, whew, next year, um, we host it every February, but if that's going to be impossible, we'll try to push it uh, later to the year because we really, really want to be able have a physical event because there's nothing that can replace you know actually physically truly being being at the event um we will obviously have to make changes um to the format because we can no longer have maybe like six thousand people all at once but um that is something that we're going to be looking into um yes so that's it thank you so much for um allowing me to share uh, the work that we do and i hope you enjoyed that thank you Thank you so much to our speakers. And now we have come to the portion where we will have them both here with us digitally on screen to discuss a lot of your questions and comments. Thank you so much to our viewers. Uh, we received so much, but we only have to curate some of the questions that we will um, ask our panelists for this afternoon. So we'll dive right into our um the next question so since we started today's program our comment section has been um brimming to the full so we picked out a few just to get the discussion going and the senders of our first three questions will be the lucky winners of the publication crocus by dr gerard Rico. so let's start by welcoming back in this panel andre and rika good afternoon guys hi Hello, good afternoon Thank you again for spending this afternoon with us. So the power of bringing together people and the acknowledgement that we all don't know what the future holds for all our <laughs> festivals and events. So we have the first question here from Instagram. Um, she only gave the IG handle, La Planita. So for both of our um, speakers, how do you envision the future of creative communities given this new normal? Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> ako, ako talaga, no? No, um, muna. <laughs> muna. <laughs> Break muna. Um, uh, how do we envision creative communities? Yes. Um, I, I, th I think given the new normal, creativity has been at an all-time high. Um, you know, artists continue to create. Artists are, continue, uh, are, are continuing to lend their voices and advocacies to kind of respond through their work um, with uh, uh, 
with what's happening you know um in 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 the country and and in the world um so i think walang problema walang problema sa 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 creativity um but uh in terms of what we can do what you know what uh, organizations um institutions and government can do is perhaps learn from what was lacking what is lacking during the pandemic um to be able to support these creatives to be able to support these artists to kind of continue the work um Obviously, uh, and dami nating challenges of like losing space, losing work, um, and and I think one one of the one of the the things that that I see and hopefully will kind kind of come to fruition are um are um opportunities uh that that we can give to um our local artists. Um, to kind of you know empower them, uh, whether it's uh, on a digital digital uh, space or in a physical space. Uh, so so sana talaga mas strengthen natin ang 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 avenues kung saan uh, makaka-provide pa tayo ng uh, ways for artists to continue to uh, to respond and engage with the world. So for me, um I truly believe that the future is creative. Um I think the pandemic has emphasized now more than ever that we need to think outside the box. We need to revisit our old ways of doing things and find new ways to do them. Um, also in a world where I think one of the things that, that the pandemic has emphasized is really technology. And with, with growing technology, some of us, whether we like it or we like it, some people will be losing our jobs. And one of the, with, with automation, many people will be losing their jobs. There are so many industries that, you know, are that are threatened by automation. And I think one of that is really the call centers. And so that is one of our biggest contributors also to our GDP. So I think we really need now more than ever to be more creative than we ever have been to find ways for the many number of people who will be, who may, you know, whose jobs are at risk. Um, Technology and automation might be able to replace some procedures, but it will never be able to replace ideas. It will never be able to replace the creativity um, and minds that, you know, that, that come up with what's next. So I think now more than ever, the future is truly, truly creative. And we need to emphasize that, um, you know, we Filipinos, we're so good at, um, oh, sorry, there's a fly. Um, <laughs> Um, I remember going to the um, the Beijing, uh, sorry, not Beijing, the uh, World Expo in, in 2020, 2010, 11 years ago. And the emphasis was on um, on Philippine crafts and the arts, like people singing, people, um, you know, when you go abroad, you go to Singapore, you sit in the hotel lounge, it's a, it's a Filipino singer. You go on a cruise ship, everyone is Filipino in the entertainment industry. You know, that's something we're so good at and we've so excelled. Um, we have our Lea Salonga. We have, you know, so many beautiful creatives and so many talented, amazing creatives. And we just need the support. Like the industry needs its support. So, um, yeah, the future is creative. That's how we're going to be able to overcome and challenge all these, all these, all these issues that have come about as of the pandemic. Thank you for that. So uh, I believe these are three things: no creativity, uh, structures of support, like for like what Andre said, uh, the government, the your LGU and your community also uh, is part of supporting the whole creative industries. And as what Rika said, technology, like uh, that enabled us to have this platform here right now, talking to you guys and with all of our listeners. Um, there so it allowed us to transition somehow or to adopt to this new normal so segue to that uh creative industry so shout out to all creatives who are watching us this afternoon yes uh, the future is indeed creative we have a question from jefferson marcos abiba so um to both of our panelists how can young creatives be on the spotlight or at least have a part in the creative industry? Sa tingin niyo po, ready na po ba ang generation natin, oh, we're part of the young ones, to accept 
young leaders and visionaries in this industry. Thank you, Po. So how can we answer Jefferson <laughs> in this question on being part of um, a creative community and um, having young leaders like you, young visionaries? Do you want to go first I, or should I go first? Okay, you go first. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, I think, ano, talaga, what, the future is indeed creative and the future really is at the hands of 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 these young um innovative visionaries i mean rika was talking about the, how she started this initiative in in when she was 27 years old that was also me at 27 years old i was like i want to start this festival i don't know where to get the money but i think it's a good idea let's talk to my <laughs> friends i think it, it's important that when you have an idea and you wake up in the morning and you st- it's kind of still like knocking at your head to pursue it and to go for it um one of the things that um my my mentorship in 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 one of the speakers in my mentorship in new york uh said uh, was um never have a backup plan and and that may be a bad yeah. thing but that kind of like spoke to me and 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 kind of that kind of, that was kind of my mantra in terms of making things happen um not only for myself but also in establishing um fringe and pineapple lab and the many advocacies um and uh and projects that i did parang Voila, just go for it. Move forward. There's no easy path to achieving your dreams. There's no straight path, actually. Um, so ano, s- s- stick to the plan uh, uh, and be able to kind of be flexible and malleable with that plan. Um, it's important in the creative industry, in the arts and cultural sector, to listen to the voices of of young artists and creatives because that's the only way that we can uh, bring in new ideas um as a young creative when i was starting out you know we've had to deal with what we call the gatekeepers uh the gatekeepers of our industries you know these are the the older generation that you know um who were also during their young years have created systems and 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 um and uh and paved the way for us no um so so infiltrate infiltrate and and you know there's there's different like openings and there's no other person that will have your idea okay so just go for it i think and uh, young people kaya niyo yan kaya natin yan um i think now is when you're young is the best time to start because you don't have that much responsibility yet. Wala ka pang, siguro wala ka pang anak or whatever. But you know, you just want to do what you want to do. Um, but the most important thing to do is really truly believe in yourself. There are so many people who will make you contra. There are people who will bring you down, but you need to rise above that. Um, you need to believe in yourself. You need to believe in your ideas. Um, and in some senses, you have to be stubborn. You have to be you know, like, fine, okay, it's mahal, but I don't care. I want to do it. I want to get it done. Um, and you have to stay hungry. You have to be motivated. You have to want to be able to accomplish things for yourself. Because if you don't believe in yourself, who else will? If you don't do, if you don't make action, who else will? Um, kailan pa? And you really need to have that confidence in your ideas. If you look at history and look at people who have really um, made change, they started with a passion and ambition when they were young. Um, so being young is not a bad thing. I think one of the, what was a bit shocking for me when, well, not that shocking, but when when I moved back to the Philippines from the UK, um, I was 24 and I started my practice when I was 24. And, you know, I was so um so naive but and i think looking back if i had known how difficult it would be maybe i wouldn't start so maybe it's a good thing to start when you're young um because you don't know how difficult it is so game lang go lang nang go um but one of the things that is uh it's frustrating but also you have to learn to respect our elders is ageism in the philippines like i don't know i got so irritated before when people would be like oh iho iha ganito dapat ganyan ganyan mali yung ginagawa mo but just have that confidence in yourself. We need to respect of older people um, because they've been through experiences that 
it was a different time, it was a different age, and they've been through experiences that we can learn from. We have so much to get from them, but ultimately, it's you at the end of the day. Um, so just have that confidence and believe in yourself. Right. And also, so, it's, it's sorry, can I just add, it's hard work. Huh? It's, it's, it's hard yes. work. You really have to put in the work. <laughs> Hindi to parang, I just have a dream and it's gonna happen. Like, you have to work for your dream. I agree. Like, there's a lot of sleepless nights, a lot of crying, a lot of, oh my God, what do I do? Oh my God, I messed up. But it's from our mistakes that we truly learn. Thank you for that. Um, I guess just the whole industry is really challenged with so many changes and we're all asking the same question. What are we going to do? So a lot of uh, both of your topics are about festival organizing and it has a lot to do with organizing people, you know, from from individuals to organizing communities and and moving that energy towards a common goal. And so we'd like to take up this follow-up question from um, IG also. Do you believe that uh, as a digital native or is a digital space adequate enough for artists and creatives to thrive in this new normal? And what are the steps that we can take to transition uh, into the digital creative spaces or help the community cope with uh, this changing, hindi na siya new normal, it's already a changing normal. And so, what do you think about that? Go ahead, Miss Plaza. I, <laughs> Naku, I wasn't prepared. Okay, wait, sorry. Can you repeat the question? It's what can we do to it, in, our digital, in a digital space? Yeah, and if it's enough for, um, for artists and practitioners and creatives, are digital spaces enough? to thrive in this new normal? I think we need to um, stop looking at this as a temporary time in our period, a time in life. And this is the time, like, it is in crisis that people come up with amazing ideas. So use this as a challenge and an opportunity to become creative, to get creative, to, um, you know, like, find, think out of the box, to find ideas and ways um, to do things. So. Um, I've used this opportunity to pursue my master's because it's online. Um, so you know, use make make the most out of make the most out of your time. Like this isn't your time is now. So the, if there's any better time to start, it's now. Uh, it will all you'll always think that but last week you know uh, you know pre pandemic if only get it off. You can keep thinking if or you can also just do it. So just get on with it and get started and um now is really the time to shine um yeah use use constraints and use challenges and um to and turn them into opportunities yeah, i agree with uh riga i think for me as a as a art practitioner performance you know my background is in theater and performance um i was very pre-pandemic, I was very hesitant in terms of um, I, I looked at the digital world as a as a way to promote uh, what we do, but never really as a physical space where we do what we do. Um, however, because of the pandemic, wala tayong choice, right? These are the the cards that we're dealt with. We either embrace it, we innovate from it, or we kind of just not do anything, right? Um, and like Rika said, now is the time to be able to explore new ideas, to to do something you've never done before, and really embrace embrace this digital space. I mean, there's a lot of noise out there, uh, for sure, and there's a lot of like you know, uh, I guess not naman competition, but there's a lot, there are a lot of events that are happening. Everyone's kind of zoomed out already. Everyone, you know, parang especially the first what six months of the pandemic, lahat nasa Zoom, di ba? Lahat nasa uh, kung, ano, kung ano pang streaming platforms. Um, but but really, um, don't pressure yourself 
naman in terms of like I have to do something. You know, syempre, you have to develop your ideas, you have to to really do your research and then come up with something. For example, like a podcast, you know, pwede naman tayong mag-podcast or pwede naman tayong mag-upload sa YouTube or you know, or pwede tayong maggumawa ng um, exhibitions Um, in public spaces na na madadaanan lang ng tao uh, mga ganong bagay uh, na na hindi kailangang um, maggagather yung mga tao so so explore ideas actually ano din eh um, look at models that already exist or the uh, or or um or uh, what other organizations or individuals are doing in the Philippines or abroad because that might inspire you to create your own versions of these um of of these strategies uh, and contextualized it within your own realities no um so embra- embrace it talaga and and ano wag wag tayong the, the the limitations um ano lang yan is a challenge for us to kind of push past it Yeah. I think also sorry to add um you it has to be a shift there needs to be a paradigm shift and there needs to be a shift in mindset um there's this quote I don't know who said it but you know like it's a very popular quote but you know these are the cards you're dealt so play um use what is in front of you use your resources um you know throughout the early stages of the pandemic the first ECQ Uh, we could have also just stayed in bed and just watched more K drama because it was so great. But it was the time. There was like that was the time that we were able to build the emergency quarantine facilities. Would people would people give us as much resources as like would people be donating as much if it were a different time? No, um, you know. But it was something that everybody felt was necessary. There was um, there was a need for it. And so we were able to make it happen. Um, you know, use this time to 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 just play. Just these are the cards you're dealt. So play. So we can respond to crisis through creativity. That is uh, a general message that we can share with the young audience that we have. That. Um, It is possible to respond, and that response comes from us, from creatives, which is creativity. Another question from Regina, uh, about, Regina Roxanne Rivero Cayoli. So, our RC <laughs> to our panelists, which parts of your creative journey as um, artist, architect, designer, festival director, visionary, influencers made you want to pursue your careers despite the difficulties that you may have gone through? So why choose the the careers and and um the passion that what you have now? What made you choose? Me first. You first. I can go first. I guess. Go. Um, <laughs> go. Um, well, I, I, this, this, this isn't necessarily like a, a pandemic question, but more so like why, why we chose what we did, no? Um, well, for me, um, I always felt the need to, I know, to, to provide a space where, um. those who don't necessarily have the voice will be able to have a platform based on my experience you know um when i was like working in new york it's all it's always like it's always the same things that you see you know what i mean obviously it's better now uh in terms of representation diversity uh you know developing genres uh in terms of uh uh art and theater but I felt na may kulang, may kulang sa 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 Pilipinas at that time in 2012. You know, I I worked with a lot of playwrights who's who write great works but you know, kung hindi sila manalo ng palangka or hindi sila makapasok ng Virgin Love Fest, hindi mas stage ang gawa nila, right? So, for me it was about 
empowering artists to create opportunities for themselves and not necessarily just wait for opportunities. And certainly, that's something that um, that I kind of live by. Um, like, kung, kung wala, hindi na lang, hindi ka lang iiyak dyan. Gawa ka ng, gawa ka ng paraan. Gawa tayo ng paraan. Um, and so, also, coming back to the Philippines, I wanted to share some of my learnings and experiences when I was working for different theater companies in New Jersey and New York because not everyone can go abroad. Not everyone has the, 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 the privilege to, to, to intern at, at an international company or work, um, or, or, or work in New York City. And you, you know what I mean? So for me, there was just really this calling um, and, and parang... I don't know, maybe I'm an Aquarian about it. Uh, I was being so Aquarian about it and being idealistic about, you know what, baka, baka makatulong ako ng kaunti. Uh, so so it, it really stems from, from, from that wanting to provide um, opportunities that people don't necessarily have access to in the Philippines. Um, yeah, so... This isn't really, yeah, like like Andre said, it's like a life question. Um, basically, for as long as I remember, I've always wanted to be an architect. I always wanted to be in this industry. I grew up around building. So when I was like five, I would be putting hollow blocks together. And then my parents helped me, like encouraged me to be an architect, even when I didn't want to be anymore. Like there was a time I wanted to be a lawyer and I wanted to be a banker because, you know, it sounds cool. Um, but they're always like, no, oh, like you've always wanted to be an architect, so why don't you pursue this? Um, there have been so many times where, where it got really tough, like when I couldn't find a job, um, where I remember like when I graduated from the U when I graduated from the UK, uh, finished my undergraduate degree. It was at mm, this in 2012, I was looking for jobs and I couldn't find any employment. That was the it's like it was lang ng world financial crisis I was literally knocking on doors I applied to 50 companies I had no place to live I was sleeping on my friend's couches um just looking for a job um but that that ended up when I finally got a job it turned out to be the like so pivotal in 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 me um learning about architecture and design and realizing that this is truly what I want to do um when I moved back home uh two years after running my office we almost folded up because it's a long story but you know like it we almost folded up and we almost didn't first like didn't continue the practice but it was in that time I learned so much about myself I learned so much about the industry so much about the company um and when I said ayoko na, ayoko na maging architect um I just went through it through the difficulties through the challenges and now like I know that this is what I want to do for the rest of my life I love doing it um, and I want to be able to share with people the ideas. Um, same thing that Andre said. Um, yes, I understand that. Like, I'm very grateful to, to have the privilege of having been abroad and working. And so I just want to share that. And that's why we do anthology, right? And um, we've flown in, um, like, my professors from the UK. Like, and that's how we get them to come. Like, they're, we have some sort of relationship with, the, with them. And when we're out, when we're out of the country and like attending all these events that's when we get our speakers and we want to bring them here because there's so much to learn and there's so much to strengthen but it's not it's not even only about bringing ideas from outside to the philippines there's so much happening here that we just don't celebrate enough um so i know i'm going off tangent but basically i wanted to be an architect like ever since um and it is in the moments of crisis that when it gets emphasized that this is really what I want to do and this is really what I want to pursue. And um, I'm willing to do what it takes to get the job done. Or, it, you know, I'm willing to do, uh, I'm willing to go through all the challenges to pursue this and a life in it. So many strong uh, creative spirit uh, populating this screen right now. And I guess a practical way to also end um, the conversation, uh, we got a lot of questions about art blocks or creativity blocks. I guess people would really benefit from hearing from our panelists. How do you deal with 
creative blocks, pag ubus na, tuyut na, nasaan na, how or any practical tips, uh, personal um, tips that you could share with our audience on how do you deal with your personal creative and artistic blocks, especially when people are in quarantine, when people are so stressed and um, we are really on crisis mode. So personally, how do you deal with that? Uh, for me, don't force it. Don't force it. Um, if if there is a block, let it let it stay there. Let it simmer. Um, I always say uh, this. I, I I always do this. I'm like I, I watch something dumb. I watch something that I don't have to think anymore. You know what I mean? I just kind of like clear my head. Uh, you know, watch movies, watch YouTube mukbangs. Oh my gosh, mga mukbangs na pinapanood ko sobrang dami, guys. Pero Diba? Na, na, Nakiklear yung head mo eh. Um, kasi when you force it, talagang ma-frustrate ka kasi hindi lalabas yan. Um, but for me, what's important is like during this quarantine, I I started to to listen to music again na hindi Broadway. So like para okay, I'm gonna listen, revisit Oh India Ari. I'm gonna revisit like, you know, artists that I haven't listened to in a while and that will bring me back to like, you know, a certain time or or, or, or a new idea, right? Um, and also discovering new artists, for example. Sinasabi ko lang yung mga strategies ko personally, ha? Um, or I would watch like, a, a series right now like for example i'm watching gossip girl just because i want to kind of like get updated on what the, the gen z kind of mindset you know what i mean the words that they use the language the, the realities right and then uh you know mga ganung bagay just watch something dumb but really not dumb because then ma- mai inspire ka eh take a walk i take a lot of walks also take a walk observe people i work at at a coffee shop nga sabi ko and and i also encounter so many people so many interesting people who want their drinks a certain way um watching their behaviors may isa pa nga parang i want five ice cubes talagang bibilangan mo yung five ice cubes na yan no um pero mga ganung bagay like it's just kind of ano just don't force it do something else and then come back to it and be inspired by other people's work, by by observing people, by watching something. Yeah. yeah, I think similar to what Andre said, you just have to learn to take a step back and not force things. Like, if wala, if di wala. Um, <laughs> um, and you need to be inspired because it's part of like us as artists. Um, we're always looking for inspiration. That's why it's so sad now that we can't travel. But... Um, because it's when you travel, you get new ideas and you want to do cool things, right? But um, yeah, I think what I've done is like I I got into running. Um, this time like, I used to hate running so much, but it it's really a time of peace and a time for me to be able. When I finally like got past this lump, like it's been been a time for peace, been a time for me to clear my mind. Um, we've been William and I have been planting. Um, so now like. Planting has super inspired the way we do our architecture um, to have like that affinity to nature. Um, yeah, just it's, I think it's being, you just need to be able to be critical about your work and what you're doing so you can take a step back and and just revisit things. Um, they always say never fall in love with your work because when you fall in love, sometimes you become so stubborn that you don't want to let go or you don't want to like accept that it's not maybe the right thing. Um, but just take a step back and like for this, Lalaine will tell you for this lecture, I really was so tired to do my slides. Like I was forcing myself for the last month. But then finally, don't don't do what I did. Don't procrastinate. Like just also just do it because I didn't want to do it. And then when fi- when I finally did it, I was enjoying myself so much. But it took a while for me to be able to get to that mind space. So. Nga, don't force it, but also like meet your deadlines, di ba? Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I think, okay, there's this one thing I want to share. Um, uh, Neil Gaiman, he said, artists and creatives are three things. You are either always on time, so you're always reliable. You are, um, Allah, I forgot now, you're always on time. You Your clients really like you. You're so, like, you know, you're enjoyable to be with. Um, or you're really good at what you do, so you're super creative. And when you're creatives, you only need to be two. 
So you're, if, you, if you're always late, uh, no, if your clients don't like you or if the people that you work with don't like you, you just have to be always on time and be really good. If you, um, if you're always late naman, but your client likes you and you're really good, okay lang din. <laughs> um, and finally, if um, you are, ano yun, so always on time, if you're always, if you're good at what you do, or if you, if your client likes you, and if, what's the last one? What did I miss? If you're not good at what you do. So if you're not good at what you do, um, as long as your client likes you and you're always on time, okay lang din. So you only need to be two. <laughs> um, I like that. <laughs> yeah. All right. Yeah, it, it works, huh? <laughs> <laughs> so many nuggets of wisdom and creativity from our panelists. So before we announce the winners of Crocus and um, the winners of our online um, game, we would like to request our panelists if you have anything to share or plug or invite our uh, viewers this afternoon, please uh, take the stage and do invite us in your platforms or your advocacies. Go ahead, Rika. Oh, um, follow Andre on TikTok. I don't have TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> Um, sige, ako na lang muna ta siya yung closing kasi mas in, mas exciting yung kanya. Um, Grabe naman. Um, wala right now sa <laughs> stagnant eh. Um, follow Plaza and Partners on Instagram, follow Anthology Festival on Instagram, um and Facebook. Um you can follow me but my mine is like kind of boring. Um and okay, uh join Anthology next year. Oh Actually, next year, we're hoping that Anthology becomes more, as I mentioned, we want it to be, we want it to be more democratic. We want people from outside architecture to be able to understand and appreciate it more. That's why we're looking at ways that we can, um, you know, a bit, like, a bit like art fair. Art fair is so cool. Like people just, and made, um, you know, pe- people who don't know and like art or whatever, they just go because it, it's an exciting new event. So this is what we're hoping to do. Um, catch our updates on Anthology Fest. Um, on Instagram and Facebook and follow Plaza and Partners. And also, um, yeah, that's it. I think Andre is more interesting. I don't have TikTok. <laughs> ano, ano lang yan. <laughs> pang ano lang. Yun, yun, yun yung pag wala, pag wala na akong ideas, I just make silly videos. Um, but for me, I think one of the things that I told my lecture, my art appreciation class, the guest lecture engagement in Ateneo is follow an artist today. I think, you know, artists are always looking to um, you know, to 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 be exposed, to to for people to know their work. Um, you know, there's always like a list of artists that you can kind of follow, share their work, um, and get to know uh, what they do, whether you know there are um architects, they're visual artists, they're performers. I think it it just you know it 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 just kind of um connects uh connects artists to to the rest of the world to know that you know people are um looking at their work and seeing that their work um their works are um relevant um another thing that i want to plug is uh ano ba wala naman ko ipa plug other than ano then um you know follow fringe manila fringe mnl on ig and uh on Facebook as well as Pineapple Lab PH on IG and Facebook. We have uh, upcoming projects that we can't announce yet, uh, but will be free and open to the public, uh, especially for young artists. So please stay tuned for um, for our uh, next few projects in the, in the last quarter of the year. Also, if you do... If you're an artist or a creative and want to collaborate with Fringe and Pineapple Lab, you know, message me or um, shoot us an email or uh, message us on our socials. Um, and let's start talking. Let's do something together. Exactly. <laughs> Yon! <laughs> 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
So follow Anthology, follow Fringe, follow Pineapple Lab, follow an artist, follow Andre, and thank you for following Nate. And thank you to our panelists for being with us, for spending your afternoon with us, uh, conversing and engaging with an online audience. Um, thank you for indulging our curiosities. And we would like to congratulate the three winners of um, who, a who will win a copy of Crocus, uh, Alia, La Plana from Instagram, Jefferson Marcos Abiba, and Regina Roxanne Rivero Kaoli. I hope I pronounced your last name correctly. But please do message us so we can send you your very own copy of Crocus. Thank you for sending in your comments and to everyone who is tuned in this afternoon. Maraming salamat. Last week, we asked you guys how you express your creativity in this new normal. And we got a lot of insightful responses. So for our contest winners, we would like to thank Ega Maliari, who shared that he started writing blogs for hashtag Pilgrim Road under the banner of sustainability. This way, he hopes to creatively effect change on people towards one goal. And this is to prevent a climate crisis. Our next contest winner is Aliza Trespalias from Instagram. She shares that her involvement, involvement, creativity can be found on hopeful communities and hope fuels the passion to create. Our third winner is Wilfredo Taniedo, who is a visual artist, an art educator, and also an advocate, who shared that in this new normal, he is continuing his practice as a sculptor and organizing exhibitions in the regions. He also shares that he is opening a visual arts library with the gallery for the general public this time of the pandemic. So marami pong salamat. Our fourth contest winner is Conrad Ramirez, who also shared on Facebook that art has helped him cope with stress, anxiety, and depression during a very challenging time in his life. And finally, but not the least, an architecture student, Noel Montesines, who has been joining art competitions. We hope you join Maid to practice his creativity and find his distinct art style. He shares that no matter the result, what's important is he is growing from the experience. So for our contest winners, congratulations, Ega, Aliza, Wilfred, Conrad, and Noel. You guys will receive your very own copy of Crocus by Dr. Gerard Nico. Please again send us a message to be able to claim your prize. So thank you everyone for tuning in, in this afternoon. Let's continue this conversation online. We would love to know more about what you enjoyed most about these lectures. Give us a comment here on Facebook or post on Instagram and tag us at Metrobank Art and Design. Send us a message also if you'd like to request for a copy of your certificate for today's webinar. Please make sure to like and follow us on Facebook because something big is coming your way this September. We all know what September is for those who follow Made, We have big, big, big announcements and events that we would like to share with you. And this is something that you surely wouldn't want to miss. So again, marami pong salamat and we wish you all a good afternoon.